found her and talked to her and we realized that this woman is, has such an interesting story and she's intelligent and quick-witted and, and funny as well. And that's why we decided to make a film about her, but we never knew how long it would be, would it be possible to make a long interview with her, uh, would it be interesting enough? And we were thinking maybe to make half an hour, an hour, and just to see where it's gonna take us. And, and it, it took us to a film about today, in the end, I think. Yeah, I mean, when I watched it the first time, I had like another movie in my head, and it was the news, the current news. So... Yes. It, yeah. I mean, I, if you look at Europe, uh, the whole continent is uh, shifting to the right, and you were having a situation here as well. And it's uh, it's the same mechanism that works. It's uh, back then and today. Okay, well, it's not about comparing, but the mechanisms are the same. So, did did you feel she was truthful with you and with herself? Um, yes. Because she was very correct in her answers. She never told us anything that she just has heard of. Or if you take, for example, the, the, when she talks about the, the Goebbels kids, she didn't tell us they were killed and poisoned. She told us how she uh, found out. And, and I think she's very reflected. And at the same time, there's a lot of contradiction in her story and her personality. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a follow-up on her? She must be like 105 now. And did she see the film? Well, she's uh, still alive. Uh, she's 105 years old. Uh, and she saw the film. And what was interesting, uh, her reaction on the film, uh, when she said, um, it's, it's interesting, uh, at the end of your life, uh, if you look to the mirror and you can see um, all the things uh, you did wrong. And the film meant a lot to her. So that was a little different than what she said in the film. Her Absolutely, okay. yes. Um, one, I, I know she was in a Soviet prison for five years. Um, did she talk more about that and what she was actually convicted of? Um, she has never been convicted. She was uh, caught in, in the bunker. Okay. And that's why she was considered to be a criminal of war. And they put her in, in the camp and she never knew for how long or uh, if she ever will come out again. And her boss, in the, in the very end, um, who was after the death of Goebbels, he was the Gauleiter of Berlin, and he was, uh, he went free in the Nuremberg uh, process. Wow. Um, the, the film is so beautiful to look at, uh, and if, I was wondering if you could talk about the decision to shoot it in black and white, close up and extreme close up, and the, a little bit maybe about the lighting design. Well, I think the, the subject uh, is timeless, and that was the reason for uh, taking the decision to, to do it in black and white. Uh, Handel's uh, memories come back to life, and uh, we thought that uh, black and white could um, underline her memories and uh, create also smooth uh, transitions to the, to the archive materials. And, uh, well, the close-ups, it's just easy if you, if you have that face in front of the... If you have that face in, uh, in front of the camera, um, you have to do it in, in close-ups, of course. For the close-ups, it's also the idea was that nobody can escape her, her story. If you have the close-ups of this woman on the big screen, you cannot escape. You cannot. There's no other place to look at. That was pretty much the idea behind it. 
uh, following up about the archival footage, one of the decisions you made was to show, first of all, to put long clips in, complete clips, and also to show the source of the material. And I, I thought that was an interesting choice and I was wondering why you did that. Um, all that archive material, it's all propaganda material. So today, um, it's used often in, in TV and they rework it, recolor it, put music on and edit it. And I think that's very dangerous because it's still propaganda material, it still works. And that's why we decided to leave it as it is, add nothing, take nothing away, and just tell the audience what it is, who it did, who did it, and, and the rest is up to you. And also where you got it. I thought that uh, was, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, I'd like to open it up to our audience. Um, I'm sure there's several questions. Right over here on your right. Um, I just wanted to ask about your decision to use the footage from the concentration camps and the footage from... You can't hear me? Louder, okay. I wanted to ask about your, your decision to use footage from the concentration camps and footage from the Warsaw Ghetto of the people who had died there. I know directors have the very difficult decision when making films on the Holocaust to decide whether to use that footage and how to use it. Uh, and I know some directors have decided not to use it for various reasons. So I wanted to know why you decided to use it uh, and, and can you explain that process? Uh, he wants to know why the directors chose to use the concentration camp footage and that it's usually a, a, a difficult decision on the part of the director. Well, uh, Brunhilde Pamsel never left Berlin and uh, the war itself uh, came late too. Yes, <laughs> um, Brunhilde Pamsel never left Berlin and uh, the war came late to Berlin. Uh, so it was the decision uh, to, to show the, the footage uh, from the concentration camps to give the view and... and uh, hmm? the counterpart uh, on her stories from Berlin to, to have the, the whole the view on what happened during the Second World War. In the beginning of the film, she says that everything is gray. Every civilization, every event has its good and its bad. Those that look bad also have their good. But at the conclusion of the film, she says, there is no God, there is only the devil. It's black and white. There is no justice. Did you see her make that transformation over the course of the filming? And do you think that that reflects what happened to the German people from 1945 to the late 1960s with the Auschwitz trial? Uh, yes, I think I think you're right. And during the interview, uh, she went through her whole life, and we could tell that it triggers something in her every day, day by day. She got in deeper, and it happened something to her. And in the end, she gave because we repeated many questions a lot of times because she doesn't. Sometimes she doesn't want to give an answer, and she's like grabby and but so you had we had to repeat the questions over and over again two days later and later and then in, in the end she gave completely different answers sometimes and um, it was also that a lot of memories came came up in her she already forgot or put somewhere in the back of her mind and, and it all came to life again in her and that, that you can you could really tell during the interview there was a process in her over here. Yes, I'm a German Jewish refugee. I have four children. I'd like to buy four copies of that film for them. Can we do that? <laughs> yeah, 
we, we can give them to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. One over here. Um, I love your photography and uh, well, I have a question. Um, did you ask her about Kristallnacht and did she have any response to that? Because it seems like she seemed like that she just didn't see any of this. And um, also, what was she typing? I mean, she was typing some important things that she must have known something. Um, it seems like some selected memories. And so I just would like to know that. Thank you very much for doing the film. Well, thank you. Uh, we did ask her about Reichskristallnacht, of course. And she, her answers were like, oh, I knew there was something going on, we found out next day, and then, oh yeah, there was this one neighbor, and he was uh, beaten up, and, and, but we didn't see a lot. And then, again, she remembers that she did see something, yeah? that the neighbor was beaten up, the, the shop next door, owned by a Jewish family, was destroyed. But, as you said, it's a very selective memory, of course. Yeah. Uh, but the typing, the only stories she told us about typing was that one story with the uh, um, Scholl siblings, where she remembered exactly what she did, or remembered, she told us. And the rest, she said, she was just typing. She was never interested in what she typed. And, uh, well, I don't know, of course, there has been, uh, it was a very bureaucratic system, of course, so of course there must have been many banalities, but also as well other things. And maybe she doesn't remember, maybe she doesn't want to tell, but I think that's not so much what the film is about, what she typed, because it's not so much about her personal guilt, it's, uh, it's about human nature. And it's about today and it's about everyone uh, who is looking for his personal advantage, um, just small steps, and yeah, you might end up at a place like Brunhilde Pontel did. Um, my question doesn't exactly follow what you just said, because what I was going to ask, and will still ask, is do you think she's a criminal? Criminal? Um, if I think she's guilty, yes, of course. Looking away is, uh, uh, that makes her guilty enough. Being not interested makes her guilty enough. All right, we have one over here. I'm interested in seeing the other side. There's a gentleman from a doctoral program right here in the city and he started a communication between Jews from the Holocaust and their descendants and descendants of Nazis. And um, I never been to it, but I started identifying with the German people when I was scammed by somebody from Nigeria. And after $5,000 of scamming back and forth, I decided to communicate with her and ask her why she did that. And she said, because I was an American. And for the first time, I could identify with the German people. And I typed back my email that that doesn't mean that I approve of what the United States politics is. And I think that really helped me to understand that the Germans, they were really duped. Of course, some of them knew. But I think in general, they were victims too. They were lied to. And we have to remember to not punish the new generation for the old generation. And I'm guilty of it too. 
please don't. Any other questions? Right over here in the center. Yes, hi. I, I feel like this movie should be called Excuses, and the excuses should be a why, why, why not, you know, stand up, and why not do the right thing? I mean, why not, you know, risk yourself, but stand up for something? I mean, it just, it's, it's upsetting to see, to see it and to see that you were so silent. It's just hard to watch for me. Any? Well, I hope that we can um, encourage uh, younger people and, and future generations uh, with that film um, to stand up at the right moment and uh, to say no. Um, one more to your l left. Um, I found it to be a very effective, effective film. I was, I was very, it was very moving. My question is, um, what was left on the editor's floor? How many total hours of interview did you do with her? And how do you make a decision what not to include in the movie? What are we, what have we not heard? Thank you. Well, we have another, I think, 30 hours of interview with her. And of course, there's a lot that you didn't hear, hear and, and see today. And we're still thinking about what to do with the rest of it because it's uh, really, an, apart from the film, a very interesting document and we might donate it to some museum or we'll figure it out. Further back here on your left still. I w just wonder if you, if you, if you asked Ava Lowen, if you asked her, about conversations that Ava Lowenthal would have had with her saying something like, the people you work for are attempting to murder my people. Did you ever kind of go there with her? Um, yes, of course. We tried to find out as, as much as possible about, about her relationship to Ava Lowenthal. Uh, but like in her whole life. She was still with Eva and they still had a coffee, but they, but the rest of the story, she didn't want to know. Not even of one of her best friends. She never saw the whole picture and she still doesn't. When you think of, when she says in the film, the Scholl siblings, if they would have kept their mouth shut, they could be alive today. She sees that in a very personal, on a very personal level but she still doesn't see the whole picture and she still doesn't see why they did it and why it was important that they did it. And it's the same with Eva. She was just having a coffee and that's it. And Eva went with her to join uh, the NSDAP. And she didn't even think about that one moment. And when she says that Eva wanted to visit her in the Ministry of Propaganda, she said that she she didn't want her to come there, but maybe not because of Eva, but maybe more because of herself. Hello? Okay. Over on your left. Um, in Jay's uh, synopsis uh, of this film in the festival guide, I believe he ends it by saying that all of us are going to end up asking ourselves what we would have done. Maybe I shouldn't read so many synopsises because I was thinking that about that very question throughout the whole film and I still haven't come, I still haven't answered myself. Perhaps it would help me though if I could ask you guys. Uh, have you asked yourself that question and if so, have you reached an answer. Um, when you're born in Austria, you grow up with that question. <laughs> what would I have done, of course? And you keep asking yourself and you keep wishing, 
that you would have done the right thing, but you never know and you never get an answer. And before we did, did the film, maybe I was hoping that when we finish it, I would get closer to a clear answer. But in this case, uh, it's even more difficult to, to give yourself this answer because it's uh, because of her story and because it shows how easy it is to get in involved into something and that question uh, I cannot answer that for myself I know what I hope for but that's it Hi, thank you for this uh, important film uh, the question I had was uh, uh, form the form of this film uh, apparently you were asking her questions but the film itself seemed like a monologue where you didn't hear any of the questions that uh, the directors had asked. Why, uh, why was your decision to do that? Well, um, the decision was to focus on her and uh, uh, not disturb that... Uh, that ambient uh, with questions or, or comments because there's so if you if you look to television um, all these things are always commented so it was really necessary to do it uh, in an opposite way and to force the audience uh, really listen to her Yes, and <clears throat> I think it would be a very different situation if you have the interviewer in the film, because then you're watching someone interviewing someone, and we wanted her to tell her story directly to the audience. Am I on? Okay. Hi. Um, thank you very much for this. It's going to be a lot of food for thought forever, for all of us, I'm sure. Um, I had two questions, n not about her, oddly enough. W one was the, oh, about the Soviets. How in the world did they n never tell people? That seems so odd. Um, they're in Buchenwald, and they never told them what had happened there previously. I, I found that really the, the most unbelievable thing in in the film, so that's one of them. And then after the film, you said that her boss, was that Hans Fritsche, that he was not um, convicted and in the Nuremberg? So I'd like to know about that too. Uh, Hans Fritsche was the only one who, was, who went free in the Nuremberg process in Nuremberg, yes. Why? Well, I don't know, because he, I don't know, maybe he, because he was clever, I don't know. <coughs> no, I think he, um, I, didn't, I didn't watch his uh, trial, but um, I, I don't know, <laughs> actually, I don't know, and I wonder, and that's also something that uh, uh, is very disturbing for Brunhilde Pomsel because she was imprisoned for five years. And uh, of course she knew as she was in Buchenwald uh, where she was. That, that's what she says in the film. That's where she found out that um, she was under the shower and it was the same place where they killed a million of people. But that's, she says that's where she found it out about it. And, Uh, that uh, standing under the shower uh, was a reflection uh, from today uh, to the past. When she stood under the shower, she, well, she told us she didn't know. She knew about it uh, when she came back. Well, <laughs> but I mean... I, 
I think that's a hard thing for them to answer why the Soviets didn't say anything. Any other questions? We have time for one last question over <laughs> here on your left. Um, thank you. I thought it was an enormously valuable film, and when I was watching it, I was thinking one of the most valuable things is, unlike her, we have this history, and in multiple forms we've seen it, and hopefully we can. Do you think, I mean, part of your reason for making it was to have people not just get lost in their personal lives. Because I have to watch you to film like this, and but with other films on front, other things. Can we get lost in our personal lives anymore? That's a question that I have that I think this film helps answer, or I would hope it would. She was lost in her personal life. Yeah. So. It was one of the motivations to show the danger of being lost in your personal life. Yes, I think so. I think they're agreeing with you. So we're going we're gonna to continue the discussion at Shahar Zahav, 16th and Dolores. Uh, we'll meet there in about 15 minutes. It's a short walk. And we'll have a discussion for another half hour, 45 minutes. Thank you.